Hello, I'm Draggy Warmer, and this is Serial Bookworms, where we will be walking through the web serial Mother of Learning a few chapters at a time. Today we're covering chapters six through nine. And to start us off, we'll go through each of the chapters and kind of do a bit of a play-by-play high-level summary. Uh, we left off with our main character, Zorian, having completed his first loop through time that he finds himself this month of time in the city of Sayoria, where he is learning higher magical education. Um, the initial inception, it seems so far, is a lich uh, smashing him against one of his classmates. And then uh, he repeated the month. At the end of the month, he didn't run into that lich again. He just boarded a train and left Sayoria. And yet, he still wakes up back in his room with his younger sister, Creel jumping right on him. So, Zorian boards the train, once again heading for Sayoria. And he's having a bit of a panic attack at the situation he finds himself in. But he kind of talks about masking a bit, where he projects a sense of calm outside to calm himself inside. And he kind of starts reviewing what he knows about the time loop. He thinks about not going to school, but that would be irresponsible. And Zorian is a very studious and responsible person. He wouldn't want to, you know, maybe this is just something that happens a couple times and then the month will move on. You know, you don't want to make any life damaging decisions. And armed with his foreknowledge of who will board the train, he picks a different place to sit and he runs into somebody new, Bjorn. Uh, he normally hasn't run into this person because of where he sat previously. And amongst the introductions, as soon as his last name Kaczynski is dropped, uh, Bjorn immediately lights up. And once again, Zorian's older brother is dragged in with, oh, oh, are you related to him? And we kind of see Zorian shut down a little bit. Uh, he employs, I would say, some strategies that might be known as gray rocking, um, which is usually a tactic whenever you're dealing with um, like abusive manipulative behavior. You know, you act uninterested and unengaged, so they lose interest. And it's kind of interesting because this isn't the first time Zorian has had such a negative reaction to being associated with his older brother. We've also previously had some indications that his older brother uh, may not have been so great in private, you know, using some spells to practice on Zorian. Um, so it it does seem Zorian may have a bit a, a bit of trauma um, underneath uh, 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 what's going on with him and in his past. Um. Let's see, he is sort of doodling in a notebook. Um, he still has the phonetic incantation that the Lich used on him. And the boy notices him writing while ignoring him and, you know, just asks about it. And Zorian comments like, oh, I did my own research, you know, Syria has a big library. Of course I visited the library, I couldn't find anything. And Bjorn is like, well, did you ask the librarians? And then Zorian is like, no, actually, I didn't. And it turns out the library system actually has like library specific divination spells specifically for finding books. <laughs> so you can, you can imagine just being able to control F for a book while inside of a physical library would be very nice. <laughs> um, with this information, Zorian is like, all right, maybe Baron's not so bad. And they, you know, they have a normal conversation. Um, and he, you know, he's like, all right, this, this guy deserves a little bit of attention for, you know, actually being helpful. Um, it also, I would say is kind of interesting that he has this initial negative reaction while talking with Byrne because of his older brother relationship being brought up. So he kind of shuts down, but then when Byrne is kind of helping him out, he flips around. And I think that's also important to note that. Zorian won't doesn't seem to hold people like 
he won't he's not really bearing a grudge against someone you know he had a negative interaction with them then he had a positive interaction he reassessed his feelings on them and you know he you know started interacting with them more normally um it really seems like zorian is very much a a logical person and so armed with this new idea you know once he gets off the train in sayoria he heads over to the library to get a job. And, you know, this is going to be really hard. You know, he's like a student. You know, it's a, it's a library. This is a professional. Oh, no. Uh, actually, they immediately ask when he can start next. Um, and in fact, they are rapidly trying to get people to work there. Um, because like real life, library is underfunded. <laughs> um, it's also interesting that the library does have security measures so there are differentiation between the public library and the secret library with all or like the secret forbidden texts of forbidden spells <laughs> and Zorian is introduced who will be teaching him at the library and it's Ivory except he didn't actually meet her this loop because he changed where he sat on the train ah. He made Bjorn, but didn't meet Ivory. Already we're seeing how just the tiniest changes in these time loops have such rippling effects on Zorian's experience through them. And uh, Zorian is going to have to deal with being compared to his brother again, because Ivory starts gushing over. Oh, actually she's gushing over Fortov. Uh, Zorian's charismatic older brother who's still at school with him. Uh, it turns out Ivory has a bit of a crush on him. Zorian doesn't know how to feel about this, uh, but uh, he still has a very negative opinion of Fortov. Uh, Zorian is getting a lot of L's this chapter with his assumptions. Um, it's also, I think, a way of reinforcing that overall feeling of not knowing what's going on that Zorian finds himself in with these time loops. You know, everything he assumes to be true and factual, he keeps stumbling a little bit because, oh no, this is actually wrong, or oh no, uh, they're thinking of someone else. They're thinking of something else. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how Zorian perhaps matures and is better able either knowing more or just having a more, uh, 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 not jumping to conclusions as far as what he thinks about other people and what he learns. Um, despite all of these unknowns and all these L's he's catching, he is pretty good about breaking down this big nebulous problem into small rocks he can digest in the immediate. And he's chosen schoolwork, library. But he gets another solution, possibly, to the Lich's spell um, because he is pointed to they have a history teacher at this school. And this guy does not sound like the typical middle school sports coach has to teach class and teach his history situation. This guy knows 37 languages, which frankly is quite impressive because I barely know one. And... <laughs> It also, I think, is another really interesting way to build the world through small details. Because typically in your fantasy stories, you know, we usually see you got like three languages, maybe up to five, you know, human, elvish, dorvish. And then maybe you'll have like the old tongue or like a magic language. And while it's quick and easy to do things like that, I feel like in a way it kind of ends up flattening the history of how old these civilizations might have been. Because, like, even English has evolved in the decades and centuries. Um, so, if you imagine you have distinctly different societies, different um, beings within a world, each of them with their own centuries, millennia of history, they could have all sorts of their own forgotten, mutated, regional dialect language situations. So, you know, by having like you know, 37 languages, I feel like it, it more leans into the depth of the, this is a lived world that has a history to be explored. And I'm pretty sure it's only in a time loop that I could pick up a second language. Never mind mastering one. <laughs> 
So Zenomir Olgai, the history teacher, is probably about as stereotypical of a wizard as you can expect. He's got the robes. He's got the long white beard. And you basically put this to VHS and you've got Sword in the Stone. Hmm? Hmm? Thankfully, uh, Zenomir is quite helpful and is able to point out this is a soul magic spell, uh, also necromancy, which I'm pretty sure everybody is surprised that a lich cast. You know, liches, soul magic, necromancy, pretty rare combination. <laughs> the teacher is also extremely concerned and Zurian decides to kind of spill the beans on the whole invasion thing and gives the excuse that he overheard some people talking about it. And that's you know how he learned about the spell. Um, the history teacher seems to take it pretty seriously, which is uh, pretty, you know, kudos to him for, you know, taking, taking what a student reports, no matter how zany or out there it seems. And so Zorian goes home and, uh, you know, he gets a, he gets a visitor and goes to answer and he gets a knife to the gut, uh, possibly about 37 times. So I guess that's what you get for uh, sharing what you know freely. There's also a bit of horror to this situation because he feels himself dying and he remembers this when he comes back to life in the next loop. And he awakes with a sharp pain in his gut from Kriel jumping on him in bed. I feel like Zorian is taking significant sanity damage here. You know, you just got stabbed by some kind of assassin or someone, and then your immediately next moment of consciousness is a sharp pain in the gut. <clears throat> Not good. Not good. Uh... On the little bright side, uh, Ilsa... The, uh, the homeroom teacher uh, kind of notices how shaken Zorian is and uh, takes a bit of pity on him and offers to teleport him, which is the first time that we're hearing about teleportation. You know, Zorian has been taking the train to Sayoria this whole time, but uh, teleporters? Why don't we have those? Um, because she, you know, hasn't previously offered it, Zorian is not teleporting to Sayoria, and she didn't teleport him previously or give him an offer. Uh, I think we can conclude that teleportation is perhaps something advanced, possibly dangerous, or very taxing on a person to use. Um, but the fact that teleportation is still possible is still an interesting tidbit to keep in mind. And if it's something advanced, I mean, if you're in a time loop, Seems like a pretty good skill. Uh, Zorian uh, briefly ponders repeating the situation that got Ilsa to teleport him because he saves like almost a whole half a day getting to Sayoria. But then he stops himself and realizes like, hey, I need to keep in mind that this is not reality and I should not take these loops for granted. They've repeated a couple times, but he doesn't know how many times they're going to repeat, and it'd be pretty awful to do something very zany just to wake up and be left with the consequences. Imagine if you, like, emptied your whole bank account and then just went off buying a whole bunch of silly stuff. And then the time loop didn't happen, and now you have no money. That would be a problem. But how long do you think you could repeat a month without doing anything different? We're gonna have to see how long Zorian lasts. We do, we do learn an interesting detail as Zorian repeats an experiment for a few loops, taking the train out of Sayoria with a pocket watch, and every time, he rem the last thing he remembers seeing is two past midnight of the festival. Um, we kind of gloss over some of the behavior changes of the classmates with Zorian's skills and fami familiarity with what's going on in the month. Um, well, not much change with Zim. With Zim, his mentor, because his mentor still has him repeating his basic three shaping spells. Uh, perhaps Ilsa was under understating exactly how demanding Zim is of his charges. Uh, Zorian articulates some plans to really shake things up, you know, empty his bank account, mix potions, different electives, skip some of the tedious homework to do his own studies, and then Zach shows back up in class. All right, so Digital Vox uh, brings up um, about the old languages. 
um, languages in lived worlds, little mentions, but I hope it actually gets touched on or explored more. Like this is an old history book. Not only this is an old history book, only not Merlin can read. Mm, that is certainly interesting. And you know, with a whole month, I feel like we do get to see a lot more happening and more things can be done. I mentioned um, last time in the in in our first meeting, you know, if you are doing like experiments or research, you you might set something up and then you won't know any details or results for days or weeks. And a lot of time loop media is only covering a 24 hour period. So you wouldn't be able to do anything about that. This one covering a whole month, I feel there is a lot more wiggle room to do very interesting things and learn a lot of stuff in a more focused manner. So we will definitely have to keep in mind to see if Zora maybe picks up some more languages or if we explore some of those other cultures. Going into the next chapter, we have Zach now in class and he is not looking good. In fact, he looks quite sick, but that isn't enough to get Zorian to immediately talk to him about the time loop. Uh, he seems to be keeping in mind that Zack is vastly superior to him in combat and might be an adversary. On talking with Zack, it seems Zack's last memory was the fight with the Lich. So has Zack been knocked out of the time? Did Zack get knocked out of the time loop and just now returned? Or was he rendered unconscious or like in a coma and only just now woke up this loop? I feel like either option has some interesting implications of the whole situation. Well, the teacher decides Zack is in no state to come to school and dismisses him. Uh, Zorian uses this as an excuse to help him out while trying to pump Zack for some information, um, still pretending that he's not a looper. So he's kind of play, playing a little dumb, uh, although he makes a couple almost slip ups that it seems Zack doesn't call him out on. Zach, uh, while while they're talking, Zach uh, mentions that it is the soul which is being sent back in time. And we've seen soul talked about a couple times as a distinct, like it's its own observed and quantified entity in this setting. Um, but we can't really say this is for sure, as we still don't know if Zach initiated the time loop or if this is just what he assumes, considering his fallibility and losing to the Lich, I feel like we can't take everything he says as fact. Still, with a little prodding from Zorian, we see that Zack gives us quite a bit of information about the loop with a couple caveats. Uh, Zack claims he's been looping over 200 times, which, um, doing some math, um, about 16 years, putting him at a mental age of about late 20s, early 30s, uh, compared to the other characters. Um, Zack doesn't know how to stop it, and he's actually got kind of a spotty memory ever since he woke up. Hmm. Amnesia is a character trait that I kind of want to put a pin in that, and I think we might, I think I might want to expand on that in the context of a time loop uh, once we get through the rest of these chapters. Zorian decides to continue playing dumb as if he isn't looping, makes excuse about, you know, some of the slight changes because he's helping out Zack compared to how Zack remembers Zorian. Um, Zack seems to buy it considering he vaguely remembers Zorian being present when the Lich did the soul spell. And Zorian kind of leans into that. He's like, you know what? I did feel a little strange. I picked different electives and I don't know why. We get confirmation that Liches in this setting are pretty aligned with the stereotype. Uh, they're soul creatures with an object called a phylactery, which they are recalled to once their form is destroyed. Uh, Zorian also suspects that if he's a stowaway in the time loop, then there may be a third looper or even more. You know, if Zorian was roped into this by sheer happenstance, perhaps others were. He also feels like getting out of the loop shouldn't be his focus. Uh, due to the giant attack that occurs on Sayoria, and the fact that apparently he dies shortly after it starts, it would actually be very dangerous if he exited the loop right now, because uh, he needs to learn more. He needs to know how to survive, he needs to know what's going on, and he needs to put himself in a bit of an advantageous uh, position. And the loop does give him the opportunity to do all of these things, improve his skills, improve his knowledge, and improve his circumstances. 
The very next scene, we have Zorin hanging back in combat class to talk to Kairu. Uh, we learned a couple interesting tidbits of information about how magic and casting works, as Zorin asks about ways to expand his capacity. Uh, we learned that mana reserves grow with proficiency, so the more you cast, the more you can hold. Um, so that kind of seems to imply if you have a higher starting capacity because you can practice more, you kind of you kind of have a snowball effect of like high starting capacity means you have easier time getting to higher amounts. Uh, Chiron proceeds to demonstrate ways that the magic missile spell can be modified in its effectiveness. Uh, this is our first practical demonstration of modifying spells for different effects. We also learn an interesting fact that a perfectly cast magic missile is actually invisible as it's pure force. The visibility is due to magic leaking. So by this, we also learn that magic isn't something people feel around them, but it's something that can be perceived. Um, we don't really see people talk about seeing like the ambient mana. So perhaps it's something about the way mana goes into spells, perhaps like mana itself is like a gas but when it's funneled into a spell it's compressed such that it becomes observable will those mana reserves be preserved in the time loops that is also something to keep in mind if you can carry knowledge of things you learn if your soul's being sent back is improved capacity of magic something mental something soul based is it something physiological like you know, you're improving your muscles, which if your body is being reconstituted every loop, any muscle gains are going to be lost. So is muscle is mana capacity something like a physical sort of thing, or is it more ethereal? Good thing to keep an eye on. Zorian, after after talking with Chiron and getting a couple spells to practice, uh, a couple variants on magic missile, um, Zorian is back in the library, having decided to work there again this loop. Uh, talking with Ivory, we get a few new details about kind of the general political situation of this world. Um, we're kind of getting a little bit of a drip fed, but I think it's, I kind of think it's really nice how the story seems to kind of organically inform the reader about this world rather than, all right, it's history class and now the main character is just going to be a TV screen for the readers to learn about all of the history, which this character probably already knows, or it's just just a very dry way of presenting it, you know, by just these coincidences, uh, being able to inform us about this world, like how we might just bumble about and learn new history ourselves by just bumping into someone who just is passionate and knowledgeable about a section. Um, so Ivory talks about how the old alliance, uh, which was the previous nation, uh, kind of broke apart due to the Splinter Wars. Uh, Zorian's home, the Alliance of Eldmar, maintains the alliance never ended. Uh, so sort of a tale as old as time, Roman Empire, British Empire, Russian Empire, eventually collapse happens. And our historical learning is interrupted by Zack barging in to have a chat with Zorian. I learned that Zorian is trying to learn combat magic, offers to give him some quality lessons. Turns out, Zack has a uh, family estate within Sioria, though it's in disuse. Uh, it appears Zorian isn't the only person with some family issues, as it's in poor state and Zack is the heir to his family. We learn about reflexive magic, which is kind of similar to muscle memory. Like, when you cast a spell often enough, it becomes reflexive. You can do it with less components. You know, you don't have to do a chant. Maybe not the gestures, maybe not the formula, or maybe not even with anything at all. There's some talk about, uh, or actually relating to the ref reflexive spells. Uh, Zach says he has like only a couple spells down to a reflexive nature. You know, your magic missile, your shield, flamethrower, you know, a lot of the stuff we might think of as like something very easy and very staple spells. But the fact that Zach has claimed to have looped over 200 times, you know, he's about 16 years, and he only has some very simple spells being reflexive, I think also is interesting to keep in mind as far as how much you need to cast them for them to be so automatic that you don't need various uh, components of casting a spell. And despite 16 years, he only has a couple things. So 
Uh, it seems like if we ever see people using something absent of components as if it's a reflexive spell, I think we can keep in mind that, oh, oh, this person used that a lot. Oh, this is their bread and butter. Wonder if those reflexive spells are something physically ingrained or if it's a mental exercise. Hmm. We certainly have not learned too much yet about how tied the mana system is to a physical body. So we will have to perhaps keep those in the back of our minds as we learn more. There's also uh, more talk about um, people's mana capacity. So Zorian and Zack sort of relate it to the number of magic missiles they can cast before running out. Zorian is a little bit below average and can cast 10 magic missiles. Zack can cast 232. And they do a bit of math, and it basically comes out that Zach has, uh, because apparently there's like an actual limit to how much a person's maximum capacity will grow to. And apparently Zach has about six times as much max capacity as Zorian will ever be capable of. And this is like out of the world, way above uh the median like zach is a huge outlier in m most people's potential maximum capacity of mana which is interesting it also is interesting that the magic system has inherent capacity differences per person and they can be differentiated but it has many ways to prevent it from being purely stratified society with big mana pool good low mana pool chaff because not all casting is dependent on having a lot of power to put into a spell. We've seen a lot of these simple shaping spells, these um, sort of like practice things, how they favor building habits and finesse, sort of like dexterity scaling your magic ability. And it's a thing that if you have more strength, you're unable to manage to do. And I do like Whenever there is these magic or fantastical systems, I really like it when they aren't so stratifying. You know, I, it's hard to find like exact words, but like you don't have like, oh, these people are inherently better than everyone else and all these people are inherently worse than everyone else. It just, for, for making up something, it just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. So the fact that there are trade-offs, you know, yeah, you might be strong in this, but that means you're gonna be weaker in this other thing is really nice and <laughs> balanced. <laughs> uh, Zach gives Zorian a way of seeing magic while they're in Sioria. Um, so he can not only feel the magic he's casting, but actually watch himself as he's casting it. Um, apparently because Sioria is such a glut of mana because of the giant hole that's spewing it out, it's usually impossible to like view the ambient mana because it would just be like a static kaleidoscope overwhelming you. But uh, a experimental spell that Zach learned uh, is kind of filtering out a lot of that noise. And at the end of the lesson, Zorium walks home taking away something very different from Zach's efforts of uh, magic missile tech. He will never be able to face Zach or anyone like him head on. He needs to walk his own path. Next, we find our characters. They're back in class. Zack talks about some of what he goes through in the time loops. Uh, Sayori is actually a rare visit from him. Usually it's just a break or when he's feeling nostalgic. But in the past, he's gone out of his way to learn about all of his classmates and doesn't consider it a waste of time despite the time loop and them forgetting all of the talks with him. And this makes Zorian realize he's never tried to do anything like that in his loop so far. Uh, at least, you know, he, he doesn't really, he hasn't really tried to learn, uh, even from his best friend, Benisek, he more of just is annoyed by him and avoids him. Um, and it certainly gives us another contrast between our two characters. Zack is more outgoing, you know, more empathic. Um, doesn't really treat, you know, the time loop as a problem, it seems like. He just seems, seems to see it as an opportunity. Uh, Zorian is a much more logical. He's focused immediately on these problems in front of him, and he's trying to, you know, improve himself and figure anything out he can about these problems. And while Zorian never did any of the any of the uh, 
talking with his classmates. He did think of going to the library uh, more often, whereas Zach stepped in it once and then never visited again. So really hammering home that Zach is uh, more of a doer than a thinker. <laughs> He, Zorian kind of begins to think Zack isn't really a stowaway. There's kind of too much going on that would be very beneficial to put Zack in a time loop for. You know, the large mana reserves that would take a while to build up to. He's the last member of a very famous noble house. He's very charismatic. Very convenient to have a huge amount of time for Zack to polish his skills and mature in a way that no one would know or be able to, you know, perhaps be aware of. Uh, Zorian, however, resolves to stay unknown and avoid whoever it is behind Zack, at least for now. Later, Zorian meets with Ilsa to get some mentorship as Zim is still having him refine his basic three shaping spells. Uh, we learn there are actually thousands of variations of shaping spells, and she gets Zorian a book detailing 15 to work through. And this gets Zorian's mind thinking. He asks if he could demonstrate mastery of all of them within the in the book within a month, and if he could transfer mentorships off of Zim to her. She says she'd fill the transfer out right now, but is skep skeptical that he could do it. Zorian smiles. <laughs> We learn some more world building about the specifics of shaping spells and how the variation, how their variations rather than spells outright themselves, but how there are ways to learn and practice foundational skills that are used in casting many spells. For example, the spinning spell while levitating a pen is a way to practice multitasking because you're having to focus on pushing the pen away from your hand, but you have to use a second force to get it to rotate. And then in our final chapter for today, we open with Zorian using some of the book divination he's been learning from working at the library, still trying to find books over the Majara language, which was the uh, uh, phonetic, yeah, the, the language that was pointed out to him by the historian in the zoo in the loop that he got stabbed in. And he wants to better understand the exact specifics of the necromantic spell that was used on him. We get a line about how Zorian picked the spell, like the, the book divination spell up very easily, because uh, the visualizations were simple. They were natural even. And Ivory thought he was kind of pulling her leg because he, uh, he picked it up way faster than she was. And it's a little interesting that the text seems to be going out of its way to emphasize this point. So I think it's something we should keep in mind for anything else that Zorian seems to be oddly good at. Uh, we're interrupted by Ivory, though, who is not looking very well. And Zorian realizes what has affected her. Looks like she's come into contact with purple creepers. And we learned that Ivory is the girl who Fortov pushed into the purple creeper patch and begged Zorian to make a solve for. Uh, Zorian had realized that if he wasn't in his dormitory, Fortov wouldn't find him. So to avoid his brother, uh, and due to avoiding his brother, Ivory hadn't been cured of the rash. Zorian kind of feels guilty about this and immediately resolves to mix up the cure for her to help out. And she tells him it's no big deal, but he's like, oh, no, 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 no. I wasn't doing it because I didn't want to do work. I just didn't want to help Fortov. I'll help you. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's very late in the evening and the alchemical workshop is locked up. Ivory wants to see how the cure is made and Zorian feels a little awkward as he'll be resorting to a bit of an unorthodox way of gaining access. This becomes even more awkward because Zack was waiting for Zorian at his home as well. The whole crew rolls up to the locked door and Zack is surprised that Zorian seems to admit to no unlocking spells, which are considered restricted magic. Except, no, it's even simpler than that. Zorian is simply a lockpicker to a level that he can actually do it without physical lockpicking tools. Uh, he basically exudes his personal magic in kind of a cloud to feel out the mechanical tumblers of the lock and then manipulate them into place so that he can unlock the door. 
And this seems to be kind of an unstructured force spell, you know, kind of releasing a cloud that fills a space, you know, exerting a force. Um, apparently, this also doesn't trip most wards because it doesn't count as magic breaking and entering. Uh, so another little interesting intersection of magic and physics. And, you know, sometimes you don't need a spell. You just need physics. Once the salve is mixed up, Zack gives Zorian some magic items, offense and defense for the impending invasion. Zorian's good deed of helping Ivory be courage of the rash is appropriately rewarded by Ivory misinterpreting Zorian's lack of a date to the festival as an invitation for them to go together. And Zorian is frustrated. <laughs> At the dance, Ivory asks Zorian if he knows anything about Zack's sudden competence because they've been hanging out for so long. She thinks it's because of time dilation, like a facility that slows down time so that you experience years inside when only a day or two has passed outside. But she waves it off as like an urban legend kind of thing, rather than anything factual. Hmm. Interesting idea, Ivory. Perhaps we should ponder that as well. Eventually, the attack happens, but it's Rainy who raises the alarm, not Zack as winter wolves show up minutes later. Briam, the uh, person who has the fire drake familiar, talks about how he's able to summon his familiar to him because the bond is connected through the soul. So it seems like souls provide a closer connection like at a, in a different plane than like your physical presence. So that's an interesting aspect of souls. Everyone eventually makes their way to the shelter and Zorian kind of gets bad vibes from one of the students near him. And those vibes are immediately vindicated as that student pulls out a vial and smashes it, releasing sickly looking smoke. Uh, Zack wasn't able to hold their breath fast enough, complains that Zorian is still standing, only for the loop to come to an abrupt end as a giant toothy maw descends upon Zorian from a giant brown worm. That's worm with an O, thank you very much. Okay, that's not related to me at all. Uh, explodes out of the ground nearby him. And that is where we end our chapters for now. Um, some, some, some little questions I think are worth uh, pondering on perhaps before continuing uh, further reading. Uh, do you think uh, the line about visualization being a natural breadcrumb to a special skill that Zorian has or it's a red herring? You know, the, div the library divination spell visualizations being so easy for him to process, you know, it just, it's just information. I can easily see it. Um, if you think it's a skill, do you have any speculations as to what it what Zorian might be good at, you know, if he has some special ability. Or if you think it's not some kind of skill, do you have any ideas where the text might be misdirecting us over? And furtherance of that, do you think main characters need to have something special to make them compelling? Or do you think it's more interesting if they're just an average any person who becomes exceptional through their own efforts? It's certainly a, a time loop is certainly an interesting situation where most anyone could become great given an infinite amount of time. Well, we don't know if it's infinite. Um, circling back to amnesia that I mentioned uh, when it came up a while ago during the chapter play by play. So. Amnesia is sometimes an interesting trait in a character used in either, you know, movies or books. Uh, sometimes your main character just doesn't remember anything about their past. And it's kind of a way to have an established character, but they're also kind of a blank slate. So, you know, they don't remember things. So it makes sense for people to explain basics of the world to them. It provides an opportunity for an author to have uh, someone from their past suddenly show up to add amount of drama or tension or a pivot point. But Amnesia could also be thought of as kind of an inverse time loop in some ways. Um, if you think of, I believe the movie was uh, 51st Dates, um, because there's the person who 
only like forgets everything except for like up to a point um, because they have difficulties forming new memories. And so they start having like a written uh, book of like the things that they learned and uh, experienced previously to like catch themselves up back in the past. And it seems we're going for an interesting mix with Zack apparently having partial amnesia. You know, he's not completely blank slate, but we know he has holes in his memories, which means we can't trust anything he says. So yeah, we get a lot of new information, possibly about the time loops, about Zack, about this whole situation, but they're immediately cousted in this shroud of doubt because of the potential amnesia issue. You know, is it because of the soul attack? Is it just, you know, because he's lived so long in a time loop, it's causing issues with his memory? Um, we're gonna have to hopefully keep in mind, we're gonna have to see if Zorian develops any other, any similar memory issues as we go through, or perhaps see if Zack's memories start coming back. Certainly will be one way of getting more confirmed information. With that, I think that is going to be it for us with the serial bookworms for today. I thank y'all for stopping on by. If you're reading along or if you just want to listen to some people talk about books. Either way, take care and thank you. I'll see you next time.